In this module, we'll discuss the little book, The Tao of Pooh. So hopefully you've had a chance to go through it. It's a, it's a quick read, uh, and it's a really interesting, easy and accessible way to learn quite a bit about Taoism and the basic principles of Taoism, as the author, Benjamin Hoff, uses the Winnie the Pooh stories and the Winnie the Pooh characters to explicate and describe the basic principles of Taoism. We're going to be using this version of the book. Hopefully that's the one you have. Um, I'm going to be calling out page numbers from this version of the book. Uh, perhaps your page numbers might not match exactly, but obviously since this is a video you can simply stop it and, and find where we're at. So let's start with the with the vinegar tasters and let's talk about why that's significant. I'm on page six here. The vinegar tasters is a painting of Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, and Kung Fu Tzu, the founder of Confucianism, and all three have dipped their fingers into the vinegar and tasted it, and two of them are sort of squinching their faces with very unpleasant looks, but one of them, that would be Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, is smiling. And why is that the case? Well, on page six, about halfway down the page, it reads, in the painting, why is Lao Tzu smiling? After all, that vinegar that represents life must certainly have an unpleasant taste, as expressions on the faces of the other two men indicate. But through working in harmony with life's circumstances, Taoist understanding changes what others may perceive as negative into something positive. From the Taoist point of view, sourness and bitterness come from the interfering and unappreciative mind. Life itself, when understood and utilized for what it is, is sweet. And that is a message of the vinegar tasters. So bitterness is simply a natural part of life, and life is good, therefore bitterness is good, hence the smile on Lao Tzu's face. Next we'll look at a very important concept in Taoism, referred to as Pu, P apostrophe U. It means something like uncarved block, if you had to translate it into English. It's not a perfect translation, but it gets pretty close to the spirit of what's being said here. The notion of Pu basically encourages us to be happy for the natural state of things, uh, things in their natural, untouched, unadulterated state are okay. And why are they okay? Well, because they're natural and they're worldly. There's a certain beauty and simplicity in its naturalness. Turn to page 10. We'll read a short segment here. I'm at the very bottom of page 10. The essence of the principle of the uncarved block is that things in their original simplicity contain their own natural power, power that is easily spoiled and lost when that simplicity is changed. For the written character, Pu, the typical Chinese dictionary will give a definition of natural, simple, plain, honest. Pu is composed of two separate characters combined. The first, the radical or root meaning one, is that for tree or wood. The second, the phonetic or sound giving one, is the character for dense growth or thicket. So from tree in a thicket, or wood not cut, comes the meaning of, quote, things in their natural state, unquote what is generally represented in English versions of Taoist writing as the uncarved block. Of course, as you've no doubt figured out by now, there's an interesting play on words here. Uh, P apostrophe U sounds uh, a lot like P-O-O-H. So Pu is Pu. And that is the secret to the happiness of Pu. He 
accepts the world as it is. He really does very little, but things always seem to work out. There's a sort of simplicity about Pooh that, that is admirable, and perhaps that is the key to his happiness. Turn to page 20, another quote that will work for us here. From the top of page 20, when you discard arrogance, complexity, and a few other things that get in the way, sooner or later you will discover that simple, childlike, and mysterious secret known to those of the uncarved block. Life is fun. And then there's a little story from the Pooh stories. Now one autumn morning when the wind had blown all the leaves off the trees in the night and was trying to blow the branches off, Pooh and Piglet were sitting in the thoughtful spot and wondering. What I think, said Pooh, is that we'll go to Pooh Corner and see Eeyore, because perhaps his house is blown down, and maybe he'd like us to build it again. What I think, said Piglet, is that we'll go and see Christopher Robin, only he won't be there, so we can't. Well, let's go and see everybody, said Pooh, because when you've been walking in the wind for miles, and suddenly you go into somebody's house, and he says, hello, Pooh, you're just in time for a little smackerel or something, and you are, then it's what I call a friendly day. Piglet thought they ought to have a reason for going to see everybody, like looking for small or organizing an expedition, if Pooh could think of something. Pooh could. We'll go because it's Thursday, he said, and we'll go to wish everybody a happy Thursday. Come on, Piglet. From the state of the uncarved block comes the ability to enjoy the simple and the quiet, the natural and the plain. Along with that comes the ability to do things spontaneously and have them work, odd as that may appear to others at times. As Piglet put it in Winnie the Pooh, Pooh hasn't much brain, but he never comes to any harm. He does silly things, and they turn out right. There's a little passage on the, the simple mind that is interesting and insightful in regard to Taoism. Turn to page 24. There's a paragraph that starts to begin with. Uh, drop down about eight lines. In the final section of the Tao Te Ching, that, by the way, is the primary religious scriptures of Taoism, Lao Tzu wrote, The wise are not learned, the learned are not wise. An attitude shared by countless Taoists before and since. In other words, book learning and education will not necessarily make you wise. Turn forward to page 39. And there's a great little poem called Coddleston Pie. And the second line changes uh, in each verse and gives us some insight regarding the basic teachings of Taoism. Well, here we go, page 39. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. A fly can't bird, but a bird can fly. Ask me a riddle and I reply. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. Well, here the second line, a fly can't bird and a bird can't fly, basically tells us that everything has its own natural place and function. And that's okay. It's okay that a, quote, fly can't bird because a fly in its own natural state was never meant to, quote, unquote, bird. It has its own natural place and function, and that is good. In the second verse, uh, of course, it's, it's repetitive, but the second line is different. A fish can't whistle and neither can I. So here we see that everything has its limitations, but again, Taoism says that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. We shouldn't try to change it or make it better because we'll probably end up making it worse. And then in the third verse, the second line says, why does a chicken? I don't know why. Well, basically, we can't know everything but we don't need to know everything. The world simply does not need us to understand it, to continue functioning as it always has. Next we come across another important principle in Taoism, Wu Wei, W-U-W-E-I. And I guess um, one good definition of Wu Wei would be action without ego assertion. Action, because yes, we, we do have to do things. We, after all, have to feed ourselves and take care of our families. But we should do these things without being overly disruptive. If there's a simple 
functional way to do something, then we should do it in that way. Look at page 68. There's a block quote near the bottom. At the gorge of Le, the great waterfall plunges for thousands of feet, its spray visible for miles. In the churning waters below, no living creature can be seen. One day, Kung Fu Tzu was standing at a distance from the pool's edge when he saw an old man being tossed about in the turbulent water. He called to his disciples, and together they ran to rescue the victim. But by the time they reached the water, the old man had climbed out into the bank and was walking along, singing to himself. Kung Fu Tzu hurried up to him. You'd have to be a ghost to survive that, he said. But you seem to be a man instead. What secret power do you have? Nothing special, the old man replied. I began to learn while very young and grew up practicing it. Now I am certain of success. I go down with the water and come up with the water. I follow it and forget myself. I survive because I don't struggle against the water's superior power. That's all. So again, follow the path of least resistance. Wu Wei. Page 75, the bottom half of the page. Another good passage regarding this principle. Cleverness, as usual, takes all the credit it possibly can. But it's not the clever mind that's responsible when things work out. It's the mind that sees what's in front of it and follows the nature of things. When you work with Wu Wei, you put the round peg in the round hole and the square peg in the square hole. No stress, no struggle. Egotistical desire tries to force the round peg into the square hole and the square peg into the round hole. Cleverness tries to devise crafter ways of making pegs fit where they don't belong. Knowledge tries to figure out why round pegs fit round holes but not square holes. Wu Wei doesn't try at all. It doesn't think about it. It just does it. And when it does, it doesn't appear to do much of anything, but things get done. So the principle of Wu Wei. Uh, that is one of the reasons why water is such a good symbol for Taoism. As you know, water is very soft and subtle and passive and follows the path of least resistance. In other words, it doesn't do anything, but yet it can carve a canyon out of solid rock. So it never does anything, but it certainly gets things done. One more short passage on the principle of Wu Wei, page 86, halfway down the page. The Wu Wei principle underlying Tai Chi Chan can be understood by striking at a piece of cork floating in water. The harder you hit it, the more it yields. The more it yields, the harder it bounces back. Without expending energy, the cork can easily wear you out. So Wu Wei overcomes force by neutralizing its power rather than by adding to the conflict. With other approaches, you may fight fire with fire, but with Wu Wei, you fight fire with water. Next, we move to the busy Baxen. Uh, and of course, the, the book is a little, little bit dated, but the general point uh, remains just as forceful now as when Benjamin Hoff uh, first wrote the book. And it has to do with the superficiality of modern life and the fact that sometimes the harder we try, the farther we get from our actual goal. It's a nice little story on page 92, at the bottom of page 92. There was a man who disliked seeing his footprints and his shadow. He decided to escape from them and began to run. But as he ran along, more footprints appeared, while a shadow easily kept up with him. Thinking he was going too slowly, he ran faster and faster without stopping until he finally collapsed from exhaustion and died. If he had stood still, there would have been no footprints. If he had rested in the shade, his shadow would have disappeared. So are we trying too hard? Are we not letting things come to us naturally? Perhaps so, according to that little teaching story. Bottom of page 97, another little passage about the busy Baxen. Our busy backs in religions, sciences, and business ethics have tried their hardest to convince us that there's a great reward waiting for us somewhere, and that what we have to do is spend our lives working like lunatics to catch up with it, whether it's up in the sky, behind the next molecule, or in the executive suite. It's somehow always further along than we are, just down the road, on the other side of the world, past the moon, beyond the stars. Every time I read this passage, I think of our world today where 
uh, technology supposedly ages in, in a matter of months, sometimes weeks. Uh, we just have to have the new version of this, the updated version of that. And really, nothing really is, is being accomplished other than a few more bells and whistles that we didn't have before, most of which we don't even use. There's an interesting little story on page 118 and 119 about a stone cutter uh, that tells us a lot about the generally impatient, always forward-seeking, looking for the next big thing type of person that we've become. While instead, sometimes we should stop and smell the roses, as, as is sometimes said, uh, we should appreciate what we have. Uh, you can read the story. It's on page 118 and 119. I won't read the entire thing here. But basically, a stonecutter starts off being dissatisfied with his life and wishes to be something better. And at each stage, he gets his wish. So he becomes a merchant. Then he becomes a high official. Then he becomes the sun. Then clouds and the wind and a stone. And then finally, he's envious of the stonecutter at the very end. In other words, what he was to begin with. So he essentially ends where he began. And had he only appreciate what he had to begin with, he wouldn't have had to suffer uh, through all of these events. And just a concluding quote on page 154, near the bottom of the page, the masters of life know the way, for they listen to the voice within them, the voice of wisdom and simplicity, the voice that reasons beyond cleverness and knows beyond knowledge. That voice is not just the power and property of a few, but has been given to everyone. Those who pay attention to it are too often treated as exceptions to a rule, rather than as examples of the rule in operation, a rule that can apply to anyone who makes use of it. Within each of us there is an owl, a rabbit, an Eeyore, and a poo. For too long we have chosen the way of owl and rabbit. Now, like Eeyore, we complain about the results. But that accomplishes nothing. If we are smart, we will choose the way of poo, as if from far away it calls to us with the voice of a child's mind. It may be hard to hear at times, but it is important just the same, because without it, we will never find our way through the forest. And I'd like to direct your attention to the back cover of the book. And you get some of the character attributes of the Pooh characters. Uh, Eeyore is a complainer, uh, never happy. So he frets about things, always wishing things were different. Piglet hesitates. He's fearful of things as they are. He's anxious about things. Rabbit is a statistician. Uh, always trying to analyze things, uh, think things through. Uh, the owl, as it says, the owl pontificates. Uh, he's always trying to figure out the whys of things rather than simply letting things be. He has to know why they are. And then, of course, Pooh just is. He accepts himself. He accepts everyone else. He accepts the world uh, as they all are in their natural state. And his natural happiness is no doubt a byproduct of that.